Well, if we haven't had the chance to meet, I'm Rob Yitterberg. I'm one of the pastors. And as we're moving into the message this evening, I'm wondering if you saw the hot debate that broke out this week. Debate that was based on the new road signs on I-95 and I-84 leading into Connecticut. These signs that proclaim Connecticut as the pizza capital of the United States. Did you see this? I mean, of course, in this room, we understand that that's just ridiculous. And, and you may actually have resonated with the response of our governor who said, you're not even the pizza capital of the tri-state area. Right, shots fired. But you know, this, not much of a debate, but there is another pizza debate that I do know really gets people fired up. And we actually post it occasionally on our social media accounts from time to time just to see if we can stir some people up. It's actually this debate that we have right here on the screen. No. Hawaiian pizza, yes or no? Pineapple, oh man, see, exactly right. I can just feel the tension rising in the room. I can see the looks of disgust, I can see the joy, I can see fists pumping, right? Like, this is a heated issue. It divides people deeply between those who are right and can appreciate fine dining delicacies and those who are just wrong. That's the way that goes. No, I mean, as silly as this is, certainly people do get fired up about it because we get into this place where we feel like there's right and there's wrong. And actually this debate feels a lot like the world that we're living in all the time right now, doesn't it? Everything seems like a hotly contested issue. That there really is, there are two sides, there's right, there's wrong, there's in, there's out, there's two camps, two poles, two tribes, there's so much division, and it seems like it's everywhere. It actually, in some ways, has become a lot like a pastor friend of mine says, a lot like trench warfare in World War I. You know what I'm saying? When they, in the big battlefields, they would dig those huge trenches, and so the soldiers would be down in the trenches, and occasionally they would pop up to shoot a gun or to throw a grenade or whatever it is, and then they'd pop back down in the safety of their trench. And so it's kind of like we're in these trenches just lobbing, like my friend says, truth grenades at one another, just trying to blow it, blow it all up. And... It's happening in every facet of life, it feels like. It's happening politically, it's happen happening religiously, it's happening in your own families and in your own friendships. Is this how it has to be? Our deep conviction, and I think the conviction of scripture is absolutely not. This is not how it has to be. Which is why we're starting a new series today. Uh, we're going to be in for a number of weeks, a series that we're calling The True Fight, Tools for Divided Times. And in this series, we're not just going to examine the times that we live in, but even more, we're going to try to hear what does God have to say to us for living in these times, and let's get really practical on what are the tools, what are the things that we can actually do to navigate these times in a way that will promote healthy relationships, healthy churches, healthy society. We want to look at very practical, tangible things that we can do to navigate the divided times that we're living in, or as Ephesians 4 put it in our reading earlier, that we can begin to speak the truth in love. And so we're going to jump in this evening into the book of Proverbs. And we're going to spend quite a, t a bit of time in this series in the book of Proverbs. This book that is dedicated to the wisdom that God would have for us. Wisdom meaning knowledge that we can apply for living. And so we're going to read this, this evening from Proverbs chapter 8. If you want, you can follow along on the screen. You can open your Bible. We're going to read the whole chapter, but hang with it. It's not that long. Don't want that to be too intimidating because Proverbs come in these tightly packed little punches. And so this is God's word for us this evening. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? 
At the highest point along the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading into the city, at the entrance, she cries aloud. To you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple gain prudence. You who are foolish set your hearts on it. Listen, for I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have insight, I have power. By me, kings reign and rulers issue decrees that are just. By me, princes govern and nobles all who rule on earth. I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing a rich inheritance on those who love me and making their treasuries full. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. I was formed long ages ago, at the very beginning when the world came to be. When there were no watery depths, I was given birth. When there were no spring, springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth before he made the world or its fields or any of the dust of the earth. I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. Now then, my children, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not disregard it. Blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. But those who fail to find me harm themselves. All who hate me love death. And let's pray as we move into this together. Heavenly Father, in these moments together, we want to hear from you. We don't want to claim to be wise. We don't want to claim to, to have understanding in and of ourselves, Lord. We want to hear from you that you would give us wisdom. That you would teach us how we can navigate the days that we're living in, these days that are so full of division and strife. Lord, show us your way, teach us your path, and give us the courage and the grace to follow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So frequently in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified. And in this passage, personified as a woman, calling people, inviting people to come to her. She's Situated, we see at the city gate where people would be coming in and going out. And she puts out this invitation to anyone and everyone. To the simple, the foolish, to the men of all ages, of all stations, to come to her for wisdom. Because she has knowledge, she has words that are trustworthy, she has, essentially, she has what we need to live well, even in divided times. She's inviting them and us to seek wisdom, to seek knowledge for the sake of living. And, and so the first question, I think, in the midst uh, of these divided times we live in that I want to put out there for you to think about is, why do you think that? Whatever that is. You know, on, on all the hotly debated issues, 
Why have you come to the conclusion that you've come to? Why do you hold the convictions that you have? Why is it that you think the way you think, act the way you act, vote the way you vote? Why do you think this is right and that is wrong? On what basis? Is it because your parents told you and they, they raised you a certain way and so they raised you the right way, so that must be it, or at least that's what they got you to believe, right? Because it's their way or the highway, so I guess it's their way. Or is it because your friends said so or think so? Is it become, because there was a teacher that had a deep impact in your life or a mentor or a coach or a hero that said certain things, lived certain ways, and you're like, okay, that must be what it's about. How do you shape your opinion about things that are happening day in and day out? Is, is it because a pundit had a clever turn of phrase? Is it because a certain party that you happen to be a part of says this is the way it's got to be? Because I think the question that wisdom would ask us is, why do you think that? Is it true? Is what you think really true? Is that really right? Is that really wrong? Is this really the best path? Is that really the best way to organize society? Wisdom calls us, invites us, says, choose my instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. In other words, the first thing wisdom would say to us is seek the truth. The truth is so profoundly valuable. It's so much more valuable than anyone's opinion, even my own, for myself. Ephesians invited us in divided times to speak the truth in love, but be, to be able to speak the truth in love, don't we have to know what the truth is? It's assumed that we'll be speaking what is actually true. And so the hard part is the in love part. But before you can even begin to speak what's true, you've got to know what it is. And you might be thinking, well, I speak my truth. That's a phrase that I hear a lot. You probably hear that. But what is my truth? See, my truth is that I'm an NBA basketball player. <laughs> but the truth is that I, last, I, I actually don't have fast twitch muscle fiber. That's somewhat problematic. See, my truth is that I am happy when people wait on me hand and foot. And I want a happy marriage. Might be incompatible at times. See, when we talk about my truth, I actually think what we really mean is my experience. My story. And we have to hold it up as truth because for many... Your story was disregarded. Your experience was cast aside. You had, and it's usually a negative experience. It's usually something you were a victim of, and so you had to stand up, and you had to not just tell your story, you had to just raise it up to the level of truth so that somebody would actually listen to you. Now, what I want you to know tonight is that your story and your experience matters. It matters deep. Your story and what you've been through is worth listening to and respecting and trying to understand. And my story, my story may not be the truth. See, growing up, we had an unfinished basement. And the thing about unfinished basements is that they're terrifying. <laughs> I just think that's categorically true, isn't it? <laughs> Speaking of truth, certainly that's what I believed growing up. And so when no one was home, was I going in that basement? Not a chance. As a matter of fact, I was turning on all of the lights in the entire house and turning on the TVs because somehow the voices on the TV made it that I wasn't alone. Was there anything in that basement that was a problem? No. Was I terrified of that basement? Yes. Is it worth listening to me in my fear and my terror of going into an unfinished basement? Sure, as a child, to empathize with that, and yet, it wasn't the truth. There was nothing down there, there was no one down there that was going to get me. And so then, as I grew up, to continue to perpetuate my truth as the truth means I never go into an unfinished basement ever again in my entire life. 
kind of a confining way to live, isn't it? See, so our story and our experience matters, but the truth matters too, doesn't it? Because the truth and our understanding of the truth is how we live. We live based on what we understand to be true. I understand that if I jump in front of a moving car, it's not going to go well for me. And so I choose to live accordingly, as I'm sure you do too. When you go and visit your doctor, you want your doctor to tell you the truth, not their truth, the truth, so that you have the chance to get treatment and to get well. See, wisdom said it's by me that kings reign and rulers make laws that are just. By me, princes govern. Right, the best way to a good and just and flourishing society is to live according to the truth and applying that. That's what wisdom is about. It's about this truth. And when, an, when a society is based on truth, the society has a chance to stand and to flourish. And so being blessed to live in a country where we influence the form of government and those who will be leading into the future then we have the opportunity to vote, and our vote must be cast according to the truth. If we're going to, to have a society that's built on truth and wisdom. For families to thrive and flourish, the truth has got to be at the center of that family, informing the decision-making, the planning, the quarreling. For us to decide for ourselves and with each other what's right and what's wrong, the truth is so important. Because without the truth, what wisdom tells us is that wickedness prevails, conflicts never get resolved, opinions sway the day, and leads to destruction. The truth matters especially in divided times. The truth matters. Josh Billings was a, a humorist and a, and a lecturer and a cultural philosopher in the 1800s, mid-1800s. Ready? This is what he said. As scarce as truth is, the supply has always been in excess of demand. Right, we get frustrated, perhaps, because we feel like we're always being lied at. And he's acknowledging that, yeah, that's probably true frequently, that there's a scarcity of truth being perpetuated in our lives and in the world. But then he goes on to say, yeah, but as scarce as that is, our desire for the truth is even lower. Our demand for the truth as people, if we're honest about it, yeah, it's not always there. Why would that be? Why do we want the truth? <laughs> I mean, think on, on one hand, especially these days, it can be hard to get to the truth. And so I don't really want the truth. I want somebody to tell me what's true, but I don't want to actually have to go through the effort and the work to figure out if what I'm being told is true. I don't want to have to dig through the sources I don't want to have to figure out, are those stats being used in the way that they actually, what they actually mean and say, or are they being twisted? Because there's a particular narrative, there's a particular ideology, there's a particular bent that they're trying to sway the opinion toward. Do I just not want to put in the time, and so I'll just take the sound bites from this person and that person and that person? Because it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier than, than wading through all of the thoughts, ideas, information, misinformation, disinformation, and those are all different things, apparently. Because here's the real problem with it being hard. If we're actually committed to the truth, and it's hard to get it, it leaves me responsible, doesn't it? It's actually each and every one of our responsibilities to pursue what is true, to use the God-given brain that you have to discern if what you're seeing, what you're reading, what you're hearing is actually true. This week, you may have heard two different news stories about 
interference in the 2024 election. Interference by Russian actors and by Chinese actors, these online operatives that are using fake websites to try to sway opinion, these websites that are made to look exactly like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and other reputable sources, and then others using social media and hiring social media influencers to then bring a particular message that is there to either pr promote external interests or simply to sow discord within America along racial lines, economic lines, gender lines, whatever it is. And they're incredibly detailed and convincing. And so if we don't take the responsibility and say, okay, the reality is there are forces at work in the world that want to sow disinformation and untruth. If we aren't committed to seeking the truth, then we're just committed to be going along with whatever is out there. Over the last couple of years, there's been different times where emails have gone out to basically everybody in the church. You may have gotten one of these emails from me, sorry, <laughs> that had my name on it, that had an email address that kind of looked like it might have been an email address from me, asking for, ultimately, monetary support in the form of gift cards so that you could help somebody who was desperately in need, but I couldn't call you personally to have a conversation about it. See, this is a problem. It's very convincing. And so we have to not just take what is presented to us, because the truth is, I had no idea any of it was happening and it was just a giant phishing scam. Just as a side note, I won't ask for money from you via email, just as a side note. See, but the truth is hard to come by. But see, mining gold isn't really very easy, is it? But man, it's worth, worth going after. Finding the truth isn't necessarily easy. But it's worth going after. See, another reason that we don't necessarily want the truth is because, well, the truth may demand something of me. Right? If the truth creates some sort of inconvenience, I may really prefer to ignore that, right? I, I may choose to prefer to ignore the fact that, yeah, I have high cholesterol and so my diet probably needs to change. Right? We might wanna ignore the truth because it demands something of me that then I don't necessarily wanna have to follow through with. And so if we, if we really figure out where do our products come from, it gets really uncomfortable really fast. And it might actually demand something of us to change. And I'd rather not. You know, I'm just trying to get through each day, each week. So it just creates a whole nother layer of burden and frustration and concern and guilt and all this stuff that I don't want to have to carry. So the truth can be really inconvenient, so I'd rather ignore it. Or, or maybe the, the truth is we don't really want the truth because the truth actually... Well, unfortunately, it divides people, doesn't it? It adds to the problem that we're trying to address in the first place sometimes because it, truth can ostracize us from the groups or the people that we value, that we actually want to be in relationship with and be a part of. And so if we follow where the truth leads, then we may find ourselves on the outside of that group. It happens all the time, doesn't it? People get canceled. Richard Dawkins was recently canceled by the American Humanist Association because he made comments based on his scientific perspective that went against the ideology and the dogma of the group that he had been so proud to be a part of. It happens all the time. Oh, but that's also not new. It happened in Jesus' day all the time. The, the, the ones that rejected Jesus most, that canceled him first, were actually the religious leaders. See, Jesus was Jewish, and the Jewish leaders were the ones that turned him over to be executed. Now, he also volunteered because he was stepping into our sin and our punishment out of his love and grace for us. But they rejected him because the, when the truth came out, it was really offensive to them that he would claim to be the son of God. 
And so there's lots of reasons that we don't necessarily want the truth. We don't want the truth when, we, when we're in interpersonal relationships and we're in conflict because, you know, you might be wrong. And then that might require an apology. And it might require making amends even for the hurt and the harm that we've done to the people in our lives that we care about. And so, you know what, it's easier to not worry about what's the truth. Let's just really worry about how angry I am. And so then whoever yells the loudest is the one that we can declare at least the winner and maybe even gets to define what was true. And so, so wisdom is inviting us constantly to seek the truth, find it. It's the most valuable, most fundamental thing. And here's, here's what wisdom also shows us is that all truth in all of its forms is God's truth because wisdom was actually woven into the very fabric of creation. Did you see that? Wisdom saying that I was there from the beginning before the, the waters were given their limitations, I was right there. God was weaving the truth into every piece of the fabric of creation itself. So that the truth sets the limitations and the boundaries of the physical universe, but also of the ethical universe and what is good and right and proper for us. And so, all the truth that we would be looking for. What is true is God's truth. Seek it. Find it. And even more so, wisdom would say, live according to it. But if we will not be a people committed to the truth, then I'm not sure there's much hope for the society beyond us. Jesus himself says, I am the way and the truth and the life. If we are followers of Jesus, we've got to be committed to the truth because being committed to the truth is being committed to Jesus. And so being committed to the truth more than any particular ideology or party or perspective or, or commentator is fundamental to our absolute fidelity, worship, faithfulness, and loyalty to Jesus himself. Perhaps the greatest reason that I don't want the truth is because of what it says about me. Because the truth about me is that I don't want the truth. I don't want to face the truth that I don't live up to the standards of a good and holy and just and perfect God. I don't want the truth that I'm really actually not in and of myself worthy of God's attention, his affection, his love. I don't want the truth that my refusal to live according to the truth that God has given is actually rejection of his will and his way. I don't want the truth that I live in rebellion from God's good plan and purposes for my lives. And if he's good and he's just and he's the creator and judge of the universe, the truth is I will be judged for everything I have said, everything I have done, everything I have thought, every vote I have cast, every word I have said in anger and frustration, every condemnation I have had for everyone else when it should be coming right back at me. The truth is I'm in big trouble Because God is going to hold me accountable for how I treat people, especially people in divided times, especially people that I disagree with, that I don't like. Jesus lays it out there. He says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And the truth is, this is the standard of God that I find myself condemned. Now, the truth that is also absolutely there for you and for me is that the one who is the way, the truth, and the life gave up his life. That he took on death on a cross, rejected by those who refused to see the truth in him. That he volunteered for that because he took on my rebellion. He took on my unfaithfulness. He took on the lies and the untruth that I choose to live in so that I could be set free from this obsession with my own self-protection, self-preservation, this desire to define for myself what is true and what is right and instead can be free to live according to the truth that God has for me. 
That's the good news for you too. That Jesus himself, the truth, took on your untruth so that you could be free. C.S. Lewis was, was born into a, a Christian family in Ireland. But by the time he was a teenager, he had rejected Christianity completely. He had become disillusioned by suffering that he experienced, the loss of his mother at an early age. And so he had become an atheist, convinced that the universe was cold and meaningless and indifferent. He went on to Oxford University where he studied literature and philosophy and then became a professor and dug in deeper and deeper into his atheism, believing Christianity was simply a falsehood, a myth, a story. But he deeply longed for something more. And he was drawn to this idea of joy that he couldn't even grasp because his life was full of so much disillusionment. And over time, he became friends with another, a, a number of other intellectuals, including J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of the Lord of the Rings series. They became really close friends. And they would go and they, they would sit together at a pub and they would talk about life and they would talk about all sorts of things. And, and eventually, over time, he would challenge Lewis's atheist worldview. And over time, Tolkien helped him realize that Christianity is not just a myth, but it's the true myth. It's the real event in history that fulfills all of the deepest longings that we crave. And in 1929, Lewis said that he probably became the most reluctant convert in all of England. He had to give in to the reality, the truth of this God and this story that he could not get away from. But he continued on and wasn't necessarily a Christian immediately. He continued in his atheism, but he continued seeking what is true. And two years later, after more reflection, more seeking, right? wisdom says, when you seek me, you will find me. He began to embrace the reality of what Jesus Christ had done for him as Lord and his Savior, the truth dying for his untruth, and he was no longer a reluctant convert. Instead, he would fi was filled with by that truth with the joy that he desperately longed for. He continued to seek and seek what is true, even in his own rebellion. And eventually he, he said this, he said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. The truth had transformed him through and through the truth of what God had done for him, changed the way he viewed everything. And then he began to align his life according to that truth, no longer deciding for himself what's right and wrong, but seeking the truth of God as it shows up in his word, as it shows up in Jesus himself. It transformed all of his interactions, his view of himself, and filled him with joy. So are we committed to the truth like that, that even if it takes years of effort and seeking, are we committed to the truth? in and through all situations. Because the true fight, the first, the first thing that is present in the true fight that we're living in in these divided times is the fight over truth itself. So before you speak, before you act, before you vote, seek the truth. Because wisdom promises, blessed are those who listen to me, and those who find me find life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's so easy certainly to see the, divi the division and the divided times that we live in. And we acknowledge that it, it is hard to know what is true. It's hard to sift through all uh, of the information and things that are flying at us. And Lord, we confess that we don't necessarily want the truth. That sometimes we prefer the ignorance. Sometimes we prefer not having the demand on us. Sometimes we just want to go along to get along with the, the people in the groups that we're a part of. Lord, we, just, we confess that sometimes we avoid the truth. Lord, help us. Help us to abandon our rebellion. Help us to abandon our laziness. Help us to abandon our, our desire for ignorance and instead to be committed to the truth, to seeking it, finding it. Lord, will you help us? Help us to, to find the truth 
in each moment, in each situation, in each debate. Help us, Lord, to find the truth for life as you would lead us in your principles, your will, according to your purposes. Lord, help us be a people committed more to truth because in that we're committed to Jesus Christ as Lord. In his name we pray. Amen.